Welcome into another episode of 410 Sports Talk. I'm Glenn Martin. I'm here with my co-host, James Haskell. And this video, we're going to go over the worst five draft picks for the Baltimore Ravens in the first round in the history of the team. So we've compiled a list between the two of us of our top five worst in history, and we're going to go over them for you right now in order. Uh, so we'll start with number five. Jimbo, give us a, your number five, and I think it's, ours is the same, so I think we can, uh, we can agree on this. Yeah, Mark Clayton, number five. I just want to say really quickly that this list made my stomach hurt. Just brought back old memories. I felt like I was suffering from some sort of PTSD. Yeah, it was tough. And actually, yeah, I mean, a guy like Mark Clayton, I was so excited when he got drafted. I mean, obviously, most people get really pumped when they see a, uh, you know, when they see a, a wide receiver get picked in the first round. You get such high hopes for the guy. But uh, yeah, it never. I mean, he he had a he had a decent year. He had he had one one really good year, I would say, in two thousand six. He was picked up in 05. In two thousand six, he had sixty seven catches for nine hundred and thirty yards and five touchdowns. Uh, but after that, it really you know started to slowly go down. And then he ended his career in two thousand ten with the Rams. I believe he had an injury that cut his career short. But yes, I got to agree with you. Mark Clayton would be my number five as well. Yeah. And number four, I think we also have the same Travis Taylor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing about Travis that was interesting is he could make those amazing highlight reel catches. He could make those one handed Odell Beckham diving backwards catches, but then have a ball hit him dead in his numbers and <laughs> he had two phone books on the on those plays. I don't get I don't get it. I mean, they call it concentration. I guess that's it. I mean uh, you know, it's I funny. Know. I actually – I almost think that – just my own thoughts here. I think that when you make incredible catches or things like that, you're almost thinking. So, yeah, like you said, I mean, you're thinking less, you're reacting more. Yeah. Right? So, I don't know how you get guys like that because the next guy I think is very similar. The guys yeah, like that to think less and react yeah. more. Yeah, and I don't know what it concentrates. I just think they just don't have naturally good hands. Um, but – I don't know. Yeah. Well, the I, next I, guy I, definitely doesn't have naturally good hands. Who you got at number three? We both have him. Yeah, Brashard Perriman, who uh, I believe just went back to Tampa. Did he not? Did no, he, he went not? to the Jets. Oh, that's right, to the Jets. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so – and as you pretty much say, the Ravens of the North. They take our, our leftovers? Yeah, I was going to say, they, they. I wouldn't call them the Ravens, of the, uh, uh, you know, because of the fact that uh, they have no success. Right. Uh, I wouldn't really want to compare them to the Ravens, who have had a, a ton of success. But – I find it interesting. Let me just point this out before we get into Burchard is the fact that our first three are all wide receivers. So Ozzy, <laughs> we love you, Ozzy, but your record at first round wide receivers is pretty bad. I tell you what, Marquise is to me already better than all three of these guys. <laughs> and that was Eric DeCosta's pick. And that's with a screw in his foot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And 155 pounds soaking wet. Um, but no, yeah, right. So Brashad Perriman had all the hype in the world, had all the measurables. Uh, everyone thought, I remember going into that uh, season, they saw him in training camp. He was impressive. He looked the part, big, fast, strong, but had that knee injury. And, and I remember when that knee injury first broke, John was like, oh, he might miss a, a week of camp. Uh, then it came a week. Um, it's just slow healing, but we expect him any day now. That turned into a year, which turned into the next off season, and then he just never. And then he had no confidence, and you know, I'll, I'll say this for him: he got beat up pretty bad in the media and by the fans. You know, it was pretty relentless. So uh, he did end up having a decent year last year with Tampa. So maybe he's yeah. looking to turn things around. But as a Raven, he was horrible. Yeah, contributed nothing, nothing. So our our two and one, I think, are <clears throat> a lot of our. Viewers probably already know what they're going to be. My number two is Matt Elam. Yeah. Absolute. I mean, just terrible. Uh, you could tell you talking about not having hands. The guy was a DB for a reason because dude couldn't catch a, he couldn't catch a cold no, he in the middle. Oh no, we can't go there. We can't no, go there. no, I was going to, but it's too soon. Uh, too soon. Yeah. Too, too soon. soon. But uh, yeah, Matt Elam was just absolutely terrible. He was not a thinker. Uh, I mean, he would make mental errors all the time. I don't even yeah. know if he could tie his shoes without help. I mean, one of the worst open field tacklers I can remember 
on the Ravens. He always would try and go in and try and blow him up or dive at his legs, but not wrap. Uh, the guy was just recently cut uh, a few months ago, actually, by an XFL team. Um, so he's not doing so good there either. But, the, I mean, he, just disappointing because I remember when he was coming out of Florida, he got a lot of hype. The guy was tough at the line of scrimmage, great against the run game, you know, had all the measurables you would want, just didn't have – he didn't have football instincts, had trouble finding the ball, did, was not a hard worker, was not a, a studier of the game, didn't get his head in his – excuse me, in his playbook, and and it showed on the field. So extremely disappointing. Uh, but I actually had him as our – I had him as my worst. I had him as number one. Okay. Because to me, the guy did absolutely nothing as a Raven, nothing that redeemable. I mean, he didn't even have – a year where you look at and you go, well, I mean, he was okay. I mean, he was bad from the start. The guy was, uh, you know, and obviously he had off the field issues. He got in, certainly after he left the Ravens. But when you're a first round pick and you only spend a couple seasons, you know, three seasons here with us, that that's just not good. So I got to go with Matt Elam as my number one. But let us, why don't you introduce your number one who, who's number two on my list? Yeah, he's right behind me. I'll let him introduce himself. <laughs> Kyle Muller. Look at his face. Look at his face in my he looks punch drunk already. He looks terrified. <laughs> yeah, but he, that was his draft conference, so he's he gets has a right to be nervous there. No. But Kyle Muller, the reason I put him number one is because he was the most frustrating pick ever in my life that I can remember. Just based on the fact that he was a quarterback, of course, which you know is a big deal. He had so much hype. He had this cannon. I felt like he had this this Herculean type vibe around him when he's coming out of the draft people would talk about you know all these feats that he could do how far and hard he could throw the football and yeah he could throw the football a mile but he couldn't read a defense to save his life and he would tap dance back there in the pocket like nobody's business and I mean look the guy was just terrible he couldn't hit water falling out of a boat <laughs> goodness gracious I mean geez, yeah. I so, mean, you know, he was he was he was really he was one of the most frustrating players I can ever remember. He might be the most frustrating player I can ever remember watch play the quarterback position. The guy could not hit the easy throw. He couldn't hit the easy throws, and it turns out he couldn't hit the hard throws either. I mean, the guy couldn't hit any throw. His best season – let me just tell you what his best season. This is a first-round NFL quarterback, okay? This was in, uh, let's see, 2004. He actually played a full season. He played 16 games. He had a 55% completion percentage. He threw for two, uh, 2,500 yards. He had 13 touchdowns and 11 interceptions. That was his best season. You and know who, of course, was seven fumbles as well of those 11 picks. You know who kind of reminds me of him, in, not necessarily in a style of play, a little bit in a style of play, but not a ton, but his career trajectory uh, and where he was drafted, old Mitchell Trubisky. Yeah, that's a good comparison. I feel like there's like a little – going to take that job this year. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. I based these, as I mentioned – on my overall disgust, like from five to one, I was just so disgusted by Kyle Bowler that I don't know. And and you, the last the last two guys we talked about, Elam and Bowler, it makes such a difference. I mean, it just comes, it just proves that everyone is athletic in the NFL. Everyone is gifted, but what you do up here, what you what your habits are off the field, really reflect over time. I don't know if you ever heard the term one degree of difference, but like one yeah. degree of difference over one year doesn't make that much of a difference. But every single day when you have a one degree of difference in your habits and your, and your disciplines over an period of time, it's the difference between Kyle Bowler and a successful quarterback because he had yeah. all the physical gifts. Oh, yeah, no doubt. And I think you, you say the one degree. I think, John, we hear him mostly say get 1% better every day. Right. That is, that's his biggest thing, just 1% better every day because – you know, and it's a cliche. A lot of people say if you're not getting better, you're getting worse because the rest of the league is getting better. So you're always having to get to improve your game or you're going to get left behind. And that's kind of what happened with Kyle Bowler. Uh, just never could live up to the hype. He, yeah. I mean, Bill, Billick loved him some Kyle Bowler. And he kind of staked his whole career on Kyle Bowler. And I think that, that, that he led to, you know, Bowler had a big part in leading to Billick no longer being the coach of the Ravens. Jeez. Yeah, no, absolutely. I don't know what else to say other than the fact that I need some Tums because my stomach hurts. 
But he did well after football. He married a former Miss USA, uh, had a couple kids, and I'm sure he's very happy living out in California. So good for him. You know? I guess so. But Although, the- I will say this. I was never a fan of when people booed when he did get hurt. Yeah, no, that's terrible. I mean, you can boo the guy for performance. Yeah, but you are cheer. I'm sorry, they cheer, cheered when he got hurt. Yeah, I know that, what you mean. Yeah, you, yeah, you don't, you don't ever want to hear that. But now, I, I don't think many Baltimore fans are going to miss Kyle Bowler or feel bad for him. No, that's true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, we want to know what your guys' thoughts are. Did we miss somebody? Uh, is our list totally off? Should I be as disgusted as at Kyle Bowler as I am? Um, or is Glenn Wright, Matt Elam was pretty dang bad. Gosh, oh, my head is hurting. Um, yeah, so let us know what your thoughts are on this list. Make sure to subscribe and uh, leave a like and uh, hit the notifications button, and we will be back soon. See you.